Fleisig. Good afternoon. Welcome to the show. I'm Jim Fleisig. During today's show, we will discuss progress being made in secure cloud computing in the federal government. With me today on the show are Frank Kodixny, uh, Chief Technology Officer, U.S. Air Force, Tonya Harding, the Chief Information Security Officer, Department of Labor, Chris Bowler, the Director of Security Governance, Risk Management and Compliance, and Acting Deputy Chief Information Security Officer at HHS. Sean Wells, Director of Innovation Programs, Red Hot, Red Hat Public Sector. Sarah Jackson, Vice President for Sales Consulting, Public Sector Applications at Oracle. And Don Hewitt, the Director of U.S. Public Sector Workload and Cloud Solutions, HP Enterprise Services. Let's get in and talk about progress in cloud complete, uh, <coughs> computing. Let's start with Frank. Frank, tell us about some progress you see being made over at the, at the Air, Air Force with your cloud programs. Okay, Jim. The, um, we're moving along. It's taking a while, of course, because the Department of Defense is secure, is concerned about security a lot. Got to make sure all the everything is there. And, and so we have a security uh, requirements guide established now for cloud computing which lays out by data level what kind of uh, NIST controls have to be applied. Mm -hmm. We've also set up in the Air Force a managed service office to actually migrate the applications to the cloud environment in an orderly way, at the same time doing apps rationalization so we get rid of the applications we find are duplicative. At the same time, we're looking at a, a program now to actually do auto provisioning into various clouds environments, not only into the DUD cloud, but also into uh, several of the commercial clouds so that we can do this quickly and efficiently because we have the mandate to actually move most of the applications by FY18. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take a while to do that. At the same time, we're working now on a contract vehicle to actually let us contract with various cloud providers in an easier way than actually doing one-off one contracts every time because we have started on a particular contract and we have a, we'll probably have our first large cloud endeavor in the summertime already established, but it took a while to get that contract established because it's a one, one, uh, one term, term contract. Yeah, yeah, good. It's um, interesting because every time we've done something on cloud, people do talk about having the opportunity to look at what we don't need anymore, applications we can get rid of, and what you know, and so forth. There are those kinds of uh, advantages. Uh, Chris Bowler over at HHS, tell us, uh, tell us your involvement in cloud, some progress you see being made across the department. Well, actually very similar to what Frank described. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, one of the things that I think differentiates what HHS is doing is we were the first agency to actually issue an agency FedRAMP authorization. Okay, good. Uh, and since that time, we've done uh, four other authorizations. So we're taking a really proactive approach in making sure that we are we are able to consume the things that we need from a mission perspective mm -hmm. um, and doing our due diligence around security um, hopefully taking a little bit of load off the jab in the process as well the joint authorization board um, and so right now we're really we've we've done a lot of these authorizations now we're in kind of the consumption phase how do we actually consume the cloud how do we right. how do we leverage the advantages that the cloud has um, and again how do we how do we buy the right. cloud. Um, how do we stop the one-offs? Um, right. You know, the, these individual transactions that program owners or or system owners are, are doing. And how do we do this in a really cohesive, uh, coordinated fashion? Yeah, it sounds, sounds like you at the enterprise lever put in place the sort of the framework that will allow the operational units and the, 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 those that can take advantage of the cloud then begin the implementations. That's right. Yeah, That's you're right. doing the steer and let them do the rowing. That's right. <laughs> yep. Uh, Don, you had over at HP Enterprise. Talk, tell us a little bit about how you are positioning to support all these cloud cloud opportunities that are coming along. Absolutely, and it's really, um, if I can say it's really exciting time of the industry as far as where we're going and where we're taking a lot of our solutions. One of the things that is becoming very apparent, I think in 2015, is turning to that transformational year, you might say, where the government's really looking at that traditional IT infrastructure and how can they move that to more of a cloud-like infrastructure by which we start to take advantage of some of the things that has been touted uh, as a promise from cloud for years and years. Really taking advantage of the as-a-service models, really mm -hmm. looking at how we can take advantage of a brokering fabric to start looking at things that will enable uh, that consumption to be much more economical for the government, but also much more performing oriented to what the mission needs are. 
So we are really excited to how things are, are moving, and HP is making a significant investment to make that sure that happens for our customers. Yeah, one would think, you know, when you think of HP, you're in that business, and uh, mm -hmm. if cloud's a, a happening thing, you would think HP's got to make sure they're out in front of that curve, too. Uh, Tanya Manning over at the uh, Department of Labor. Tell us about some of the progress over at Labor in, uh, in, this, in this area. Right. So um, at Labor, we're continuing to make a lot of progress in terms of leveraging um, cloud services and solutions. As you know, we've migrated our cloud email system to a federal community cloud, and in doing that and leveraging other services available through that, we're able to leverage some online collaboration tools such as SharePoint Online and Link Online, enabling our employees to collaborate better across the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and we're also broaching and trying to address some of the mobility requests and needs of our employees. You know, a lot of our employees, newcomers are accustomed to using mobile devices, so they're asking that they're able to um, use their mobile devices or leverage internal devices. So we've started to uh, pursue uh, mobile device application development within mm -hmm. the department. We're also right now piloting um, a mobile device management service so that we can manage those applications because as you know, you become more mobile so does um, the increase of inherent security risk with that. So Absolutely. right now we're piloting and we're hoping to move that into production before the end of the summer. Wow, cool. A lot going on there. And, uh, and, and right, that mobility issue, um, as the next generation of the workforce enters the workforce, um, mobility is going to become one big issue. Uh, Sean Wells over at Red Hat, how's, how are you guys positioned to, to play in this space and support uh, your customers and, and get out and involved in the game? Sure. So, so Red Hat's main focus is to be to really become a catalyst in open source development communities. So we work with the NSA to introduce multi-tenancy into the hypervisor tier, mm -hmm. which is foundational for infrastructure as a service providers. So with that work we've done at NSA, we then kind of flipped it over to the NRO, uh, where we now have the ability to consolidate multiple networks, uh, top secret, secret compartments, onto the same infrastructure as a service offering. And we've done that. Uh, it's actually received accreditation now. And as far as we know, we're actually one of the first cross-domain infrastructure as a service providers within the government. No, that's pretty cool, you know, because when we first started talking cloud, everyone would say, well, I could see people moving some of their admin things and some of their low-hanging fruit mm -hmm. things, but it's when you get to mission critical stuff and see, you know, that's going to be a big stretch. That's going to take a long time. But uh, here I, um, you're relating back that it's happening today. So it's, uh, One of the first. So it's <clears throat> starting to bleed over and, and actually become accredited. And mm -hmm. as part of that, there's there's organizational maturity to, to mm -hmm. kind of cruise through the CNA process, how to apply the NIST, mitiga NIST mitigation framework. Right, right. Very good. Um, Sarah Jackson over at Oracle. Tell us uh, how Oracle's playing in the cloud world. And, and uh, I mean, we go, go back a long way with Oracle <laughs> and follow the uh, evolution. And tell us where you're at now within the world of cloud. That's right. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, so Oracle's made a lot of progress as far as the cloud goes. Um, we're taking a little bit of a different approach than, than some of the other vendors. Um, we're looking at what our customers need. And really, they need every level of the stack available in the cloud. So software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. Kind of got our start with SaaS, mm -hmm. so deploying things like human capital management, ERP, planning and budgeting, and now we've introduced PaaS, so platform as a service. So right. being able to do things like database, Java, documents, um, integration cloud services. We feel like that's really important for our federal customers. And like you said, we got our, our start in the federal government, so we certainly understand the, the right. sensitivity around security. So we've also invested in dedicated data center infrastructure for DOD and federal civilian uh, to make sure that we have all of the compliance and authorizations, things like FedRAMP, right. um, to, to deliver on those. And, and I guess the last thing I would say is um, also for our private clouds, so the, the federal shared service mm -hmm. centers, we're also delivering new innovations in those areas, too, for things like complex contract lifecycle management, governance, risk, and compliance. Wow. I mean, everything as a service is uh, certainly uh, the mantra for everywhere. And when we get into the Internet of Things, man, I guess I guess I get my get my toast delivered by drone and, well, as a service. And you know, I mean, who knows who knows where the world's going to go? It's going to be interesting down the road here. Um, let's talk about, you know, our audience all, also always likes to hear about a program that's going well or something, a program that we can point to. Let's start with uh, Tonya this time over at Department of Labor. Can you point to a program that you think cloud is making? 
making a difference, something that's going well and making a difference in uh, supporting uh, the Department of Labor? Well, definitely. Um, we certainly are leveraging several. We have lot 11 um, infrastructure services that we're leveraging through the cloud or mm -hmm. platform management. So overall, it's allowing us to operate more efficiently. It's decreasing our landscape, um, our overall IT landscape, so it's freeing up resources to focus on the mission. And also, there's a great cost savings for the department. And specifically, I'll reference our cloud solution service, and that okay. is a combination of our email, um, it, and moving to the federal community cloud email, we have um, enabled our employees, which was one of their greatest um, requests from an IT perspective, to have access to a larger email box. So we migrated um, our, our email boxes and increased the size from our users having only 200 meg space on email to over 50 gig. Wow. Um, and that has freed up so much of their time. They're not focused on managing uh, email size limitations and archiving, so they're able to focus on their mission. Um, but I also need to mention the online collaboration. DOL is dispersed across the U.S. We have several regional offices. We have a lot of field investigators, so they're not able to be in the office very often. And it's um, difficult sometimes to communicate via teleconferences mm -hmm. and mail packages and um, physically through the post service. So the online collaboration tool is allowing us to share documents, manage projects, have integrated project teams across the government and share those documents in real time. So we're sharing, we're editing real time. That's also a cost effective savings sure. for us. So we sure. really appreciate that online collaboration piece. Oh, I'm sure that's that provided sounds, that to sounds us. terrific. It sounds terrific. Uh, Chris Buller, um, if uh, what would you point to the FedRAMP work as, or would you pick something else in terms of a specific um, program that you're proud of that's moving along well? I, I am definitely proud of the, the work that we're doing from the agency authorization side mm -hmm. with FedRAMP. Okay. I, I think we've, we've really defined um, a really solid process um, to, to move these authorizations through um, so that our folks, the, the folks that are actually on the ground work in the mission, mm -hmm. um, have the tools available to do what it is they need to do, um, whether that's, uh, you know, processing drug data or curing cancer. Right. Um, we've got a lot of people who are really on the front lines of a lot of really interesting things, and this really hopefully enables them to be able to do that. So I definitely point at that. I would also point to some of the open data things that we have um, with respect to the health data that we have. It's public data that we can share with the public, mm -hmm. that they can use, researchers can use, doctors can use. So that's all very important too, and that's a very important component of the cloud. How can we move that data so it is more accessible? Mm -hmm. um, so I think those two things are, are, are really important, and um, we're also following in the footsteps of uh, labor in, in terms of you know moving our email into the cloud as well. So mm -hmm. we hope to see the benefits that labor has already been able to reap by doing that as well. You know, every time I do these shows, I think it would be so nice if we had really good ways for government to cross train each other and to take best practices from, because, you know, so much could be learned from your experience and so much from yours and so forth. And, you know, if they're just like, maybe we need some, some way of sharing these best practices. I mean, we try to do a little bit in the radio, but, uh, you know, there's, it seems like, you know, Every, different agencies have different ideas that are, that are working very, very well. Uh, Frank, what do you think? Um, what's, uh, what's a pro program you'd point to, a specific one that you think uh, cloud's going to make, is making or will make a big difference? Well, I'll tell you, there's, there's a couple that are interesting. First of all, remember, we're still trying to get our act together for a lot of the commercial cloud. However, we're using the commercial cloud for a lot of the development efforts, Okay. which is kind of interesting because uh, it's easier to get to, it's faster, it's cheaper. You can buy it by the drink, and so we find that the development community is doesn't have to set up a, a structure of servers and whatever to get to get their job done quicker, mm -hmm. and so we're using that as as a leverage when we actually get to a, a, a commercial cloud to move it into the commercial cloud. There's there's another program which is large data object store. Mm -hmm. We have a lot a lot of large data objects laying around from various uh, ISR missions. Let's say let's okay. say that. Okay. <laughs> And uh, we wanted to be able to put it in a cloud environment so that we could uh, contract and expand as necessary based upon the work that we need to do. Mm. And instead of setting up, you know, multiple data, set, data centers across, you know, the United States to do this, we're, we're actually doing this in a pilot program right now to actually see how effective it will be. Mm -hmm. And it looks like it's, it's, it's starting to work out for us. And we may actually go farther with that as well. It's another great idea, development tools in the cloud. You know, just think of all the people that have development tools, put them all, made them all available, and agencies can just, you know, have access and use them when pay for them as they need them and so forth. And 
That'd be pretty cool. Uh, Sarah Jackson, what's, what would you throw out on the table as a specific program that you think is pretty cool that's uh, working in the cloud these yeah, days? Yeah, I have a couple of examples, actually, both in the DOD space. Um, one is the Air Force, actually. Um, they have consolidated about 20-plus personnel systems into a single uh, self-service website that's, you know, knowledge-based, self-learning environment for retired active civilian personnel to come in and get their questions answered about deployments, okay. training, benefits, things like that. So about a million hits a month um, on that and greatly improved customer satisfaction for, for all of those users that benefit from that. Um, so that's one good example uh, that runs in our DOD community cloud that's dedicated just for DOD with our, our customer service okay. in the cloud. Um, second example is Nexcom, so the Navy Exchange Service Command. Okay. They're the folks that run all of the retail stores, hotels, um, et cetera for the Navy, um, and they hire during peak season between four and 5,000 employees. Oh. So they need to hire and onboard those folks rapidly. Right. Um, so they're using recruiting, our recruiting cloud service, and um, able to do that leveraging social channels. So looking for new recruits through things like LinkedIn and Facebook, mm -hmm. um, posting those job uh, positions out to boards like Monster and Career Builder. Wow. Uh, so again, all about happening. end user experience customer experience, and particularly recruiting is, is just so critical for our federal customers right now, um, with about 40% of the federal workforce being eligible for retirement right. in the next three years. Right. It's just, you know, mandatory that they leverage new and, and interesting channels to reach kind of the next generation of federal right. employees. Getting, getting people in faster has got to yeah. be a major priority, you know, and I think a lot of even some of our congressmen and senators are recognizing they need, need new ways to get that stuff done. Uh, Don, you, what, do you, what do you think? If I asked you for a specific program that you'd say, now there's one that's cloud's making a big difference. You, you know, it's, it's, I'll be honest with you. If I, if when I look at cloud and what's really making that difference, I really, I have to look back at the entire ecosystem and how it's forming. Okay. Uh, today, when I, when I look at FedRAMP, um, is it perfect? No. But when I look at what it's driving within industry, it's driving a lot of things that weren't possible prior to FedRAMP. And some of that has to do with the as-a-service models are starting to form. So when I look at something very simple as an infrastructure as a service CSP offering an, a solution and then another corporation that has a software developing a SaaS offering on top of that mm -hmm. granted infrastructure as a service ATO, right. I see a lot of business start to form. I see a lot of things that are really driving innovation into the federal market by which they can now consume in a much more ready basis. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to Frank's comments, when you look at how what the um, what the government wants to take advantage of from a commercial provider is really that speed to market. We're seeing right. DevOps make a huge impact right. to those workloads and such. And now when you start to see things become more of an ecosystem, as I call it, now a, a, an agency can come and buy a software package on a as-a-service consumption-based right. model and start to deliver really a time to market that really is more successful to their right. needs. So you see it more as an enabler for Correct. enabling all these additional things. Uh, Sean Wells, what do you think is a specific program you think is making a difference? I know that cross-domain, uh, if it takes off, that's, that'll be a real different. It maker. is, and there's a couple things that make it unique. So the name of it is the Centralized Supercomputing Facility. Okay. So not only is it cross-domain, it's actually to do high-performance computing to, to render LiDAR data to take satellite imagery. And one of the things that's unique in terms of the, what we're doing with the government is we open source the entire platform and put it on GitHub. So now we have the ability to put multiple agencies collaborating in an unclassified domain to build a cross-domain capability. So that project has sponsorship from the NRO, but it's brought in system integrators like Lockheed Martin, Red Hat, Seagate, the hard drive manufacturer. It's brought in NSA. So now we can forge a shared purpose of cross-domain bring that to the infrastructure as a service uh, environment. And it actually is based on an accredited system. Wow, terrific. I get excited doing the show just as every every six months or so when we talk cloud, there's so much more progress being made that uh, I've really bought into this thing, really moving along here nicely. Um, we're going to talk about some challenges here in a few minutes, but before we do that, we need to take a short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio 1500 AM. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio 1500 AM. I'm Jim Fleisick here with Frank Konexny 
from the U.S. Air Force, Tanya Manning from the Department of Labor, Chris Buller from HHS, Sean Wells from Red Hat Public Sector, Sarah Jackson from Oracle, and Don Hewitt from HP Enterprise Services. We're talking Secure Cloud. We talked a little bit about progress. We talked a little bit about some specific programs. Now let's talk about some challenges, you know, some of the, some of the tough things, some of the... Um, things you're up against that you need to get done in order to get where you want to go. Let's start with Chris Buller over at the HHS. What are some of the, the, the challenges you face every day trying to move to the cloud environment that you need to overcome to get to where you want to be? Well, I, I think, you know, I've got really a security perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so, right. so, you know, my concern is really around risk and, right. and the risk that, that we are inheriting or acknowledging or accepting when we're moving to the cloud. Um, it, having the visibility into the FedRAMP program that we've established, we've you know really run into a lot of challenges um, in terms of really understanding what we're getting ourselves into, right. what the risk is. Um, so it, it's as simple as documentation that we see from cloud service providers that really tell us what we're what we're up against and and what is secure and how is it secure. <laughs> so it, it's it's. I think really incumbent upon the cloud service providers that are that are working with the government to clearly explain mm -hmm. what it is they're offering. Um, we've also seen, I think, this perception that once you get an authorization, once a cloud service provider is able to, um, you know, then kind of market to the government and, and is there for consumption, then it seems like people just think they can move. Yeah. And and it's not that easy. There's there's a lot of governance. There are a lot of right. a lot of things that have to be addressed before you I'm really sure. move into the cloud. And it's it's education. It's clearly articulating those from a security perspective, from an operational perspective, and establishing the governance around that. Yeah. Um, it's not as, as simple or as quick as, as a lot of people yeah. think. It's not like, let's download this app and right. we're, we're off. Absolutely not. Um, <clears throat> Frank, what do you think? What are some of the challenges that you're uh, bumping into along the way here? Well, as Chris talked about, you know, FedRAMP, we use FedRAMP as the basis for, for getting a ATO, a provisional ATO for our cloud providers. But as we go up in the data impact levels to we get into mission data, we actually require more NIST controls be established, and we have just actually reviewing that to make sure that they meet those controls. But that's, again, as Chris said, it's, it's the first piece. I mean, we have other issues, too. We have, besides that security, we are who is defending this cloud, this application sitting in the cloud, because it's not going to be the CSPs that are going right. to be defending it. Right. So we have to look at who's defending it and what security controls we want to apply within it. And, you know, we have standard controls like ACAS and HBSS that we have to move into the cloud, commercial cloud structure with our applications as well to do feedback back to the, to the CNDSPs who are defending it. Right. So we, we have a lot of issues with trying to figure out exactly how we're going to manage this. In fact, DoD is establishing a, a cloud access point where we link in all the uh, commercial vendors into, mm -hmm. into it. It'll be multiple ones, obviously not one, but virtually one. But uh, that's one of the ways they're trying to defend it because we don't want connections into the, the DoD environment from everywhere right. that, we, that can't be controlled. Right. No. Interesting argument I, I hear, though, is on the security question is, you know, over the years, it, it, systems have become so complicated. We've been doing Band-Aid approaches for years and years and years and years and years. We got patches on everything and we have to update patches and that, this, that. With cloud, it's a chance to sit, step back. As someone said earlier, look at the your applications you have now, look at what you have in place, and maybe a chance to look at security from a holistic approach, you know, once again, and take a fresh look. So there's, a, you know, an opportunity also, I think, along with the challenge. Well, we're, we're doing that, too. I mean, we're standardizing in platforms as a service what we want to have. We're standing, uh, standardizing on database firewalls and things and what the settings should yeah. be. So across the board, we're, we're standardizing across, but we still have the application side coming in and saying, of course, you know, if you patch this, it's going to mess up my application yeah, now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but Lace Cloud will allow, allow us to actually put a patch out there, bring it up, test it, and roll back if necessary. Right. Much, much faster than we can do right now. Yeah, cool. Tanya, what, uh, what do you see as some of the challenges that uh, you meet each day as you're trying to move forward with these cloud right, programs? So so I'll make two points, and it's okay. kind of following okay. along the lines of Chris and Frank here in terms of bridging the department's internal authorization processes with that of FedRAMP. Um, you know, I think there was a perception before, you know, if we are le leveraging a cloud solution and it's been FedRAMP authorized, there's not much work on the part of the department, which the, the amount of effort is 
considerably reduced by leveraging that, but we still have a lot to do ourselves. So um, we've been working to create policies and procedures to standardize the department's process to leverage the Fed RAM processes um, that's available to us. But then also going over into continuous monitoring and the quarterly and continuing reporting requirements. Right. How are we ensuring that our service providers are completing those either for us, but clearly outlining who's going to do that reporting? Um, and then also one of the challenges that we faced um, last fiscal year was actually auditing. There's not many guidelines for our audits in terms of how to audit cloud solutions. Um, and the approach has been um, taking the methodology used internally for our cloud solutions. And um, in many instances, what we were able to provide internally is not available from our cloud services. And when there is an insistence on receiving that information, then the cost of our service goes up. Right. Vendors are creating information that's not traditionally provided. So we're trying to manage that process and figure out how we can um, better move forward with allowing the audit to occur because that's also required. Um, one of the other aspects that we're dealing with is our legacy applications. We have some very old applications mm -hmm. who, um, whose business is not really germane to transitioning to a cloud. They've been um, customized to interoperate internally. Um, so it's going to be very costly to migrate those applications. So we've created a process where we're evaluating and prioritizing how to migrate those solutions. And in some instances, we're just going to simply look to see if a cloud solution is available for replacement. Yeah, makes sense. I'll tell you, uh, you know, a lot of that old legacy stuff, <coughs> the opportunity to get rid of that. Sean Wells, what do you think are some of the uh, challenges that you hit each day that need to be overcome to, uh, to really get your customer where they want to be? Sure. So there's there's the concept of bimodal IT developing, where we have large ERP systems, large classic applications running on bare metal, and then you have this this mode two, where it's elastic services on some kind of platform as a service, spinning up and down rapidly. So how do we kind of cross the chasm with management tools between them to provide insight into both? And there's industry coming out with products to help do this, but a lot of the organizational processes haven't really been established on, do we treat ephemeral services, things that spin up and down rapidly, do we treat them differently? How do we do a life cycle management plan for something that might only last for two or three minutes? Wow. Uh, so it's solving kind of the, the procedural to really disemburden the developers and the user community from the security controls, uh, we see is kind of an organizational challenge that's going on right now. Yeah. And, very interesting, very interesting perspective. Sarah Jackson, what do you think are some of the challenges in moving to the world of cloud computing? Well, in regard to security, I mean, it's central to everything Oracle's doing in the cloud. So mm -hmm. from the way we design the services to how we ha house the data to how we manage the environments. So when we design our SaaS services, they are embedded with security features from the ground up. So protecting things like PII, having role-based access control, um, virtual tenancy so that you have data isolation, again, baked in from the beginning. Um, and then, like I mentioned, you know, how we house the data, Oracle's um, very focused on um, creating dedicated data center infrastructure for our DOD and federal civilian customers. So that ensures things like, you know, U.S. badged uh, employees to U.S.-based citizens to handle all the service requests, Oracle badged employees to manage those mm -hmm. environments, um, and then maintaining those environments over time, like Tanya said, um, using FedRAMP as kind of that baseline of controls, but continuous monitoring. So doing internal and third-party audits throughout. Mm -hmm. So kind of a comprehensive approach to security, not looking at it from you know the the last right. point, but looking at it from inception through right. everything that we deliver. Yeah, well said. We have, uh, in fact, uh, two weeks from now, we're doing a, sh a show on continuous diagnostic monitoring, specifically that that subject matter. And and you make good points about baking security right into the code. Um, Tom and I did a thought leadership event last week, and we were having a discussion. And, uh, and I said at that particular dinner, it's, it's disappointing that the term firewall even exists because if code were built to be secure from the beginning, you wouldn't have to ha have firewalls to protect yourself from your code or others from the code. But uh, nevertheless, uh, it's the way the, 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 uh, the world evolved. Um, Don, you, what do you think uh, some of the challenges you face on a day-to-day -day basis in trying to get where you're trying to go in cloud? Yeah. Absolutely. And I, one comment to what you just said there with respect to the code matching the security expectations. Wow. 
uh, that is something that's been sought after for quite a number of years, and I'm, I'm optimistic it will happen one day, but definitely cautiously optimistic mm -hmm. and so on. But one of the things that I really, uh, again, looking more from a CSP perspective and such, one of the things that I see being a challenge in many cases is not every cloud's created the same, mm -hmm. but neither is every enterprise. And so when you look at the entire adoption of cloud and the migration of cloud from any existing infrastructure, there are challenges that are spoken to, and Sean spoken to a little bit of also as far as how do we deal with that bimodal type of uh, concept of IT and those mm -hmm. applications. When we really start looking at how you deal with that, we are seeing a lot of hybrid IT, multi-cloud type of environment start to step up where the best solution for a customer and has to be realized is not necessarily forklifting what is existing within an IT infrastructure today and expecting a cloud service provider to provide just that, mm -hmm. but to really look at how should my environment operate within a cloud infrastructure itself or multiple cloud infrastructures. How do I bind together uh, both from a security perspective and governance, mm -hmm. uh, both from a performance expectations for my applications, but also the end goal, the business outcome, the mission outcome that I'm expecting across potentially multiple different providers. And I think those challenges right now where a lot of, uh, of the consumers are looking at the fact that I'm finding one IS or one CSP to fit my enterprise, and then I'm going to hammer it in there just as tightly as I can. What that does is a disservice not only to them as far as making certain concessions they would not want to make, mm -hmm. but also the challenge to the CSP because now they have to augment what they have defined as a standard service and now we're looking at the challenge that the costs start to rise and you miss all the benefits of cloud when you start to do things wow. like that. Good point, very excellent point. Um, as we embark upon these new directions and new things, I guess it's not new anymore, but uh, uh, we learn things along the way. Uh, lessons learned, things we are happy we did the way we were doing them, things that maybe could have wished we did different. But since everyone out there is uh, working cloud issues, let's talk about some lessons that you guys have learned along the way uh, working cloud programs. Let's start with Frank Konexny. Uh, <coughs> Frank, what are some lessons learned that uh, you're encountering as you go through this movement to cloud? Okay. First of all, you have to have strong governance. I mean as we start migrating applications to a cloud environment, you have to know what you're, what you're migrating, why you're migrating it, and you know, if it's, if it's a legacy that has to be changed, you have to understand that it has to be changed, which gives us into the, the cultural issue, which I'm sure you want to talk about, <laughs> which uh, is, you know. Frank's been on the show before. Uh, he knows uh, this is show 120, and this is the 120th show. Someone's mentioned culture as being a, a, an issue. <laughs> because? Some people don't want to move at all. Absolutely. They want to hold on to their boxes no matter what. In fact, we have some people who believe that if they can have ser their own servers, that they'll cloud, they'll make them virtualized and they'll just be sufficient enough that they can go get by with it, which is not the case, because that's not what the purpose of it is. Right. Then there's contracting, which is my fa one of my favorite topics, is oh how boy. do you properly do the contract with the cloud provider? Because we have a relationship here. We don't actually move things to the cloud. We have system integrators that move things to the cloud. And the question is, who is responsible for the end, end result at the user side as to their performance? Right. And is it the cloud provider? Is it the system integrator? And in some cases, we may have an intermediate to the cloud provider. And so we have a contractual relationship issue going on right now to try to figure this out. How can we actually get a, a direct contract to a cloud provider that we, where we're, is there, if there's an intermediate, we're concerned that the sure. intermediate goes out of business we do not have a relationship to get the data out of the cloud provider. Wow. Makes for some interesting service level agreements, I bet. Oh yes, we talked about that. We talked about uh, not only penalties, but also uh, benefits of this the SLA and how you do it. And you know, last part is always, how do you fund this? Right. Because if you fund it, it's, it's not treated as a commodity. We always wish it would be treated as a commodity because you want to buy it by the drink. Right. However, that's not the way the government funds. We fund by programs, we fund by years. And so it's always a question of if we put a mission critical system into the cloud and there's a spike in some surge activity that goes on and we expend more money than we think per month, that at the end of the fiscal year we'll have to shut off the system because we won't have any money. 
<laughs> interesting, very interesting. Um, Chris Bowler, what do you think are some of the lessons learned along the way here that you might want to pass along in the show? I wish I could come up with something better than what Frank said, but <laughs> I, 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 we're seeing the exact same things within yeah. within HHS. Um, you know, definitely the contracting, how you buy is is an issue, mm -hmm. um, how you bake in security and and the expectations into those contracts is also an issue uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that we do have the continuous monitoring we do have the visibility into the into the the cloud that we're you know putting our information in so we can make sure it stays secure um, I think in in many cases what I've experienced is that um, from a, a cloud service provider and government perspective we're speaking the same language from a security perspective but we're using slightly different dialects right. um, we uh, you know we have a very kind of uh, concrete way of doing things within the government and, and that is sometimes lost in the documentation or the practices that we see how security controls are implemented right. things like that so um, there's a translation and an education that has to take place um, that often isn't always taking place and so I think HHS and its process has really taken a lot of time to sit down with the cloud service providers and and, and walk through expectations and, and clearly articulate Articulate what it is we need out of this process. Yeah, yeah. challenges. Um, I, the, the the acquisition challenges, I'm sure, are you know just the idea that you're buying a service now and what does that mean? Who the ownership thing and who buys the equipment right. and what happens if uh, the government doesn't get funded and all those all those issues. I, I would also say that the unbridled enthusiasm of of potential cloud users also needs to be kept in check. It is a, <laughs> right. it, it is great. It is a it is a great resource to have, but as Frank mentioned, there has to be governance there. Right. Right. And an authorization uh, from FedRAMP or from HHS is getting you 80, 90 percent of the way there, right. but there's still, as Tanya mentioned, some work that needs to be yeah. done. Kind of like in this town, if the uh, Reds <laughs> Redskins win their first preseason games, don't put them into the Super Bowl yet. <laughs> exactly. uh, Tanya Manning, what do you think are some of the uh, <clears throat> lessons learned along the way here? So I'm echoing Chris and Frank again in terms of making sure that your contracts are solid, your SLAs are written so that roles and responsibilities are clearly articulated and outlined in terms of who does what and when. Mm -hmm. um, that's, a, that's paramount to making sure, you know, to having a successful implementation of cloud solutions. Um, I'd also add to that to um, maybe start small. Um, move forward with pilots and proof of concepts to make sure that the solution that you're seeking will actually work within your environment. Um, you also want to manage that program successfully because you don't want to get too far down the path to downstream to have to do any type of rework. And it goes without saying to bake security into the beginning. You may want to revisit your system development lifecycle processes to make sure when you're starting at the initiation phase that you're planning for security. You don't want to get to the end and have this exuberant amount of cost associated with integrating security requirements. Right. Now, excellent said. We all know that issue of um, if you try to put this bake the security in after the fact, the cost skyrockets. Um, I want to hear from our industry guests on this uh, lessons learned issue, too. But first, we need to take a short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. The Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I'm Jim Flysick here with Frank Konexny from the U.S. Air Force, Tanya uh, Manning from uh, Department of Labor, Chris Buller from HHS, Sean Wells from Red Hat Public Sector, Sarah Jackson from Oracle, and Don Hewitt from HP Enterprise Services. We're talking cloud. We've talked to our government guests about some of the lessons learned. Let's hear from some of our industry guests and subject matter experts. Um, let's start with Sarah Jackson. Sarah, what are some of the lessons you're learning as you move and you're helping customers move to cloud? Yeah, we've, we've seen several things. Um, I'll mention one tactical and one kind of more strategic that, okay. that some of the panels already commented on. But um, tactically, integration, we see that as a challenge that some customers are experiencing. Um, as we've said, you know, just deploying applications in the cloud is, you know, doesn't make it magic, so it doesn't remove the need to integrate. You still need those integrated end-to-end right. -end business processes so that you're sharing the appropriate pieces of data. So if you don't plan your strategy in the cloud well, our customers could see a lot of challenges with that. So I think that's something that's really important for Excellent. customers to think about when they're thinking about what pieces of their business to sure. move to the cloud. Um, and then strategically, just the culture 
um, mm -hmm. topic again. So definitely seeing, you know, the need for change management, the need for leadership on these cloud projects, because even, you know, just tactically, the, the project management function is different. Mm -hmm. Some of the decisions are made for you because right. you're going into a more sustainable type of solution. So you don't have the panels where you're deciding, right. you know, every feature and function to customize anymore. Um, so really just kind of changing that culture when you are embarking Absolutely. on a, a cloud project. Yeah, I think it was Robert Kennedy that said one third of everybody is against everything every time, no matter what it is. <laughs> um, so uh, when you get to the culture thing, uh, Sean <coughs> Wells over at the Red Hat, what are some of the lessons learned uh, that along the way for you that you like to pass on? So Red Hat has a commercial platform as a service offering. Uh, it's called OpenShift, and we partnered with the Army to bring that into the Department of Defense. And the idea is you can click a button and get Postgres, click a button and get a web server. Everything underneath is automated for you. Okay. To do that, you ride on infrastructure as a service, like an Amazon Gov Cloud or a VMware environment. So the challenge we had was defining the CNA boundary of the tiers between infrastructure as a service and your platform as a service. In the case of the Army, uh, the infrastructure provider was uh, a third-party agency, uh, an information systems agency, who was running on HP hardware. Uh, the part of the Army deploying the platform as a service ran on Cisco hardware. So okay. there became a, a, this boundary issue about approved products whereas uh, the hardware shouldn't have mattered. Right. We're deploying a platform as a service, right. so we have these demarcation lanes. And then the other thing that came up for us was where do we manage the data? And the gentleman from the Air Force kind of mentioned as we get to mission data, different <coughs> levels of encryption, agencies generally have multiple, multiple environments, multiple clouds, a mission cloud, a compute cloud. So how do we share data securely between, say, a utility environment mm -hmm. and a mission environment? And how do we plan for that ahead of time? Are, are some of the questions that we've been sure to raise yeah, as we wow. go into new environments. Wow. Very interesting, very interesting. Every time people talk about all the platforms with Amazon and things like that, it reminds me that they used to sell books one time. That, uh, uh, Don Hewitt, uh, what do you think is um, some of the lessons you're learning along the way that might be valuable to pass along and include in the discussion? You know, we're doing a lot of advisory services and consulting around customers who are really looking at migrating, transformation, right, from what you would look at as the traditional IT models into the new style of IT, which we've identified as cloud and such. One of the things that I think is, is a lesson learned that we, we try to make sure that every customer that is looking at making this journey, if I call it, uh, is really be, be aware and be uh, very cautious of false requirements. I think some of the things that it goes back to one of my last comments, when we start looking at that enterprise and putting that, really doing the, not just the, the DevOps migration, not just doing the, the app here, app there type as a service model, but really that, that full bore of IT transformation where I really start looking at how do I take advantage of this economical benefit and performance benefit of the cloud, and also there is a security benefit to it, but how do I take advantage of that? And one of the things which we have to be careful of is those false requirements, things that I had to have before and I need now, right, where well, I think I need now within a service provider. The other, the other thing that I think really needs to be understood is how do I transform some of that cautious concern that might be there of moving to a commercial service provider and leveraging that through SLAs and other types of agreements, really making it more of a business relationship. Because in my firm belief, I really do feel that from a security perspective, it's not the technology that's really inhibiting and being that high value uh, poll question that really comes out from a lot of CIOs as to why they don't want to go to the cloud, my opinion is really that comfort, that culture, right, that starts to drive this because you can make things just as secure mm -hmm. in someone else's data center as you can your own, but you have to be formulative as far as how you approach it from an architecture. You're right, You're right. it's the old culture issue again. Um, <clears throat> we like to always end the show by talking about what this all means, where this is all going, um, uh, a future vision. What will information technology look like in the future as a result of all this movement to the cloud? Are we ever going to get to the point where we're not talking about migrating to the cloud, that cloud is the, the way uh, we do computing? I don't know, but i uh, like to hear from all the experts we have here. Let's start with Sarah Jackson at Oracle. Sarah, what's your crystal ball look like? What's it look like <laughs> down the road? Where is this all going? Yeah, maybe we 
just get rid of the term cloud computing. It's just the way we do business. Um, but but I think I think cloud will be the tide that lifts all boats. You know, I think the the benefits to cloud deployments are very real and and very much needed in our federal government. So being more agile, being able to deliver more modern technology more rapidly to a broader set of users, I think people are going to get used to that. And I think whether your technology project is on premise or private cloud or public cloud, I think those benefits are going to become commonplace and people are going to expect them and demand them from the federal government technology projects. So I you know I think cloud is is a great enabler obviously and cloud deployments have a lot of value for our, our customers but I think all projects will benefit from you know just the inherent expectation right. of, of these technologies right, right. well you know the, the administration's talking about digital services and bringing in a lot of gurus from uh, the Silicon Valley to try to help you know get things expedited and so forth so we'll see um, where it goes uh, Sean Wells what's uh, what's it look like down the road to you Sean where's this all going what what will it mean to computing environments in the future sure so as, as, as an open source company Red Hat's incredibly passionate about open standards sure. so one of the things we've been doing is working with Google uh, and bringing this work into the government to define software environment to define your application as just software so a, a specification to deploy your web server with your firewall, with your network, with your storage. And in that manner, you can certify once, deploy anywhere. Mm -hmm. And with that, that work, it, part of what we're bringing in with Google is an orchestration service to tie in from Amazon to Red Hat to VMware to Windows Azure, to Microsoft Azure, uh, tie in identity between these. So that will drive commoditization of your infrastructure layers. So I think that'll make the economics a bit more interesting for people, but it'll also drive management. So as we move to ephemeral computing where services, every web server gets a new connection, it does the, the transaction and shuts down. That allows us to increase the security posture. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have persistent applications. It's just serving one need. So the, the work we're doing with Google is called Kubernetes, mm -hmm. and it's open source space that we're bringing, driving it into the intelligence and defense communities. Yeah, cool, neat stuff. Gonna be exciting. Tanya <coughs> Manning, what do you see is down the road? Where do you see this going? What's the world gonna look like to you down the road or to us and to the American citizens? So I see a huge transformation across the entire federal government, mm. um, leveraging cloud services, recognizing the benefits to doing so, um, and particularly from a security perspective with the um, implementation of various um, disparate systems across and, and having to complete requirements multiple times sometimes lends itself to inconsistencies and increased risk. So moving into a cloud environment where it's done once and leveraged by many, that lowers the risk across the government, I think having us operate in a more secure manner. Um, I also, specifically for the department, we're looking at really leveraging uh, mobile device management services across the government. We're looking at ways to address our user demands for being more mobile. We want our employees to be able to work and can perform their mission from anywhere, anytime, and do that in a secure fashion. So that's going to be um, one of the major priorities that we'll be looking forward to in the future, um, and that's leveraging some mobile options. Um, right now, um, a lot of our users, you know, they come to work, they have their own devices, so we're looking at um, perhaps leveraging some cloud services for mobile device um mobile devices to our employees um, because we want them to be accustomed to using the things that they use in their personal life. Sure. So I think bridging that gap is a great thing for our employees. It'll help um, build their morale and make them happy about coming to work. So um, that's one avenue that we will be looking at and we'll continue to move our pilot with the mobile device management services into a production environment. Fantastic, all the good ideas there, and I think you're right, preparing with, for the workforce of the future with the mobility applications. Uh, Don, you at HP, what's it look like to you, Don? What's your crystal ball say this, the world of computing will look like as a result of all this cloud stuff? Absolutely, and I, I, again, as I, one of my first comments were, it's really exciting. I think 2015 and on to 2016, we're gonna see a lot of things start to form and start to really look at 
the evolution of the service itself, right? We've seen many different technologies in the past benefit from the involvement of a market, from the evolution of a service. And what I what I really see when I look forward, it's definitely uh, to Sean's comments and so forth, and even Sarah's when we start looking at the the cloud and the technology and really the commoditization of some of the lower layers. We're really going to see that be achieved through the advancement of technology. I can look at. Uh, everything all the way back to the days of the internet where technology started to grow and enable more efficient computing, uh, more efficient processing of packets, more efficient uh, services to be offered, which obviously open up the market for other things. Yeah. So when I start seeing uh, how that's happening, both in the computing technologies, uh, certain types of dedicated processing, certain types of enabled storage, uh, solid state, things like that that start to make that lower layer become much more cost beneficial, right? Mm -hmm. But what that benefits, it has a ripple effect up through the stack, right? So things that might have been applications that I might have offered in the past, like VDI, for instance, right. which in essence might have been a cost per seat that was prohibitive for consumption by the, the federal government. Once I lower the cost of that infrastructure that needs to provide that functional role to support that application, now I see a huge benefit uh, yeah. as far as what costs I can bring to the market. And I think all this plays a part with how we handle brokering, right? How do we uh, tackle that type of question with respect to how service providers deal with a broker and how an integrator allows brokering to be a true benefit to that customer? And that's going to be enabled through technology and really advancement of the cost benefit of the market. Very interesting. Well well put. Uh, Chris Bowler, what, what's your, what's it look like to you down the road, Chris? Well, I, I agree with Don. It, I think a lot of questions have to be answered around uh, how cloud services are brokered, acquired, consumed. And I think we're probably over the next three to five years going to see that uh, solidify and take take better shape. Um, right now, it's kind of wild, wild west, everybody wanting to move to the cloud, and, and, and really the governance isn't always in place to, to enable that um, in a secure way. Um, I would also say, uh, you know, agree with Tanya that, um, you know, this allows us, HHS, to provide a lot of benefits to employees. Sure. Um, it, it, and not only just from a, a, a collaboration and communications perspective, but allowing scientists to do really cool stuff in the right. cloud, um, to process huge amounts of data, to, uh, you know, hopefully cure cancer. I mean, these are these are folks that are really trying well, to solve that's problems. That's what we want. I mean, the whole idea here, this and the big data trend and everything else is to solve problems. Absolutely. So I, I think... I think in, in three to five years, we're going to see the majority of these, the, the, the large cloud service providers move through this FedRAMP process, and we're going to have an environment that we can pick and choose from what's right for HHS, what's right for the government. Um, we're going to solve a lot of those governance issues, so people are transitioning into the cloud in a, in a secure and, and, and reasonable way. Uh, and that we're also able to solve some of the problems that we've talked about here, the governance issues, the uh, the, the auditing issues, how continuous monitoring is, is, is carried out, so we have the operational visibility into how our information is being protected. Excellent, excellent point. Um, Frank, what do you see? Is, uh, where's this all leading as far as you see it down the road? Well, I think we want ubiquitous access to all cloud providers, not if it's via broker or whatever. We, we want it to be like buying electricity that you can switch off in a commoditized environment easily for resiliency purposes because we're looking at it as a commodity. We want to be able to say, I got cloud environments in our airplane, our aerial layer, our space layer, all the layers. I could put an app out there. I could auto-provision to any, any provider I like that could provide me the best service and the best resiliency. So as we get down that path, we want to have that capability. And I think that's what you want to get to, especially in the mobile environment. Like we have like 30,000 iPads in the Air Force already. It's in a mobile environment. We want to be able to service everybody as we need it and, you know, and that's very important for us in the logistics community as, as they get parts in and when they want to service aircraft and they come down. So as we go to this environment, commoditization, security embedded within the platform, wherever the platform is put, because as we said, as you all said, we want to have security all the time there. Right. But we want to be it so easy for the consumer that they don't even know it's there. Right. They just provision the platform out there and everything is done for them automatically. Right. Very good, very well said. Well done, everybody. Um, as I always do, I try to take some notes along the way so I can uh, attempt to summarize some of the po important points we hit along the way. When we talked uh, progress, we did talk about um, security being 
uh, a big issue and need to make progress and are making project progress there, especially with uh, the FedRAMP programs. Um, talked about uh, a progress in being able to, to look at your environment and harmonize what you have and look at things maybe you don't need in the future. Maybe, maybe modernizing uh, comes along with it. Uh, we talked about collaboration and mobility came up right away on progress. Uh, it's going to allow for a tremendous more amount of collaboration and enable those mobility programs. Um, I was impressed to hearing about the cross-domain. Um, first, we, it's come up in a cloud program of hearing the fact that we are looking at some classified products and things like that being able to exist in cloud environments. Um, on specific things, we heard about freeing up resources, a lot of people talking about email as a service, online collaboration, everyone's using FedRAMP as a, uh, as a, a security uh, tool. Um, Dev DevOps and development efforts are moving more towards the cloud, specific things are, uh, around them. And uh, we heard about the 20 some plus personnel systems that are being um, integrated and, uh, and developed. Challenges, uh, risk and security certainly uh, got a share of uh, uh, the conversation there. Getting to the authority to operate becomes uh, steps that need to be done. Uh, audit came up, Tony brought up the audit issue. Uh, continuous monitoring is going to be Im important and uh, embed in security and code and build in secure code to start with. Uh, we heard in lessons learned, governance and culture jumped out and became big topics as things that need to be addressed. There are contract challenges. This is different for the acquisition and procurement world. Um, integration becomes important as well as that transformation planning. Uh, look into the future. I heard, uh, we heard from Red Hat, of course, about open solutions and look into that world of more openness that which will come with cloud. We, we talked about someday, we won't be talking about migrating the cloud. Cloud might be the standard operating procedure. We won't, we won't actually be talking about migrating to it. Um, but uh, what was drove, driven home also by a number of people is it's really about digital services and addressing things for the country, things that help save lives, things to help government do what government needs to do, and really to get to the point to, to that's what it becomes uh, all about in, uh, in to be able to do it in a, in a mobile world. Uh, <clears throat> with that, uh, I think in the future there are things that we haven't even imagined yet that are going to happen uh, once some of this falls in place. I need to thank our panelists for taking time from their busy times and coming and sharing your knowledge with all of us. We need to thank our sponsors, without which we don't have a show. Good people here at Fed News Radio that do such a good job uh, helping uh, make this happen. And of course, most importantly, our listening audience. You've been listening to the Federal News, Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM.